Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Please Expand. I'm your host, Helios Rockney. Today, I'll be interviewing David Abalafia on his most recent book, The Boundless Sea, A Human History of the Oceans. The interview lasts around 45 minutes, where we will discuss such diverse topics as why some island nations are better than navigating than others, how important trade was to motivating maritime travel, especially in contrast to other motivations such as the thirst for adventure and the religious seal, and so many more topics that I'm sure will interest you. After the interview, there'll be a brief post-interview reflection segment where I'll talk for about 10 minutes about the concept of discovery and the various ways that we use it. Okay, so that's what you should expect after the interview. But for now, without any further ado, I give you Professor David Abalafia. Hello and welcome to Please Expand. I am Mahilius Rockney, and today I have Professor David Abulafia with me on the podcast to discuss his most recent publication and winner of the Wolfson History Prize in 2020, The Boundless Sea, A Human History of the Oceans. Professor Abulafia is Professor of Mediterranean History at Gonville and Caius College, Cambridge. It is an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Well, thank you. You have already written extensively on the Mediterranean Sea in your book, The Great Sea, A Human History of the Mediterranean, and on the Atlantic Ocean in the discovery of mankind, Atlantic encounters in the age of Columbus. What made you decide to write a book on all of the oceans of the world? Yes, I think what led me to the uh, oceans, it's a number of things, actually. One is that I'd always been on the lookout for comparisons. Um, when you're writing about the Mediterranean, uh, you, you tend to think, well, um, you know, how does what's going on in the Baltic compare with that? How does what's going on in the Black Sea, etc., compare with that? And so I got interested in the theme of sort of other Mediterraneans, other um, middle seas, enclosed seas, if you like. Uh, and there are a lot of them. I mean, you've got the South China Sea, you've got the Caribbean and so on. Seas which are in some sense closed off from the bigger spaces, the oceanic spaces. But then I also began to ask questions about how those bigger spaces compare with the Mediterranean, because the Mediterranean, one tends to forget, is only 0.8% of the maritime surface of the globe. Uh, which you know is actually pretty small, and there's no denying, and this is how I finished my book on the Mediterranean, that it has been uh, perhaps of all the seas the one in which the greatest degree of interaction has taken place between the opposing shores, precisely because it's a small area and it's also the meeting point of three continents. And the oceanic spaces are obviously very different from that, uh, they're different from that also in the sorts of conditions that mariners have to face. You've got these massive wind systems, you know, in the Indian Ocean, you've got the monsoons, um, you've got winds going around the bottom of the earth, which were very much exploited by early navigators, the so-called roaring forties and so on. It's a, it's a totally different environment um, and in many ways a more hostile environment without wishing to underestimate the degree to which the Mediterranean too can actually be a very difficult environment for navigators, particularly in the depths of winter. So um, that sort of thing was leading me to think about those comparisons. But I also had long-standing interests in, as it were, bits and pieces. You've mentioned some of the work that I did on the first encounters between Europeans and the inhabitants of various bits of the Atlantic, the Canary Islands, the indigenous inhabitants of the Canaries who were first encountered by Europeans in the 14th century and then on a much bigger scale in the 15th century when they were conquered. And then at exactly the same time, the discovery of the Caribbean by Columbus and the conquest of that area. So that was something I, there I was actually more interested in, if you like, the ethnography, the way in which Europeans understood these peoples. And as far as one can proceed with this, how they understood the Europeans, that's much more difficult to, to handle. So that was taking me in that direction. But again, I actually also, for many years, had been intrigued by what was going on 
um, in the South China Sea, particularly around Singapore and Malacca. Um, it, it was something that I was drawn into almost by accident while writing a big chapter for uh, a volume called the Cambridge Economic History of Europe. And uh, there I was describing some of the long distance trade routes linking the rest of the world to medieval Europe. Um, and the editor of the volume, famous economic historian, Munir Postan, he, he said to me once, well, are you saying anything about Malaya? This was all pronounced in his strong Russian accent. <laughs> and I, uh, I, hmm, no, well, not really. So I went off to the library and found a great pile of books about the, um, the role of camphor, this strongly spelling substance which was used by the Chinese and in the Islamic world in vast quantities, and how uh, this whole trading, well, I, empires, perhaps not the word I would want to use, but trading network around Sumatra, Srivijaya in the early Middle Ages, how this developed. So I became absolutely fascinated by that and kept up my interest in that, kept up reading about the uh, early history of Singapore, for instance, which goes right back to the late Middle Ages. So there were all sorts of things drawing me towards this. And finally, also um, the comparison between Japan and Europe, which is always, particularly for somebody who's mainly worked on the Middle Ages, it's always a very instructive comparison. I'd been there a couple of times and got very much drawn into that and realized that there were similar sorts of questions you could ask about Japan's relationship to China across the sea to the sorts of questions one was asking about the Mediterranean. I see. OK. On the topic of Japan, something that I found very surprising from your account was I'll just take the example of Japan, how uh, a nation that is an island could be so uh, bad at navigating especially its most immediate waters. And there are actually many examples of this, but Japan just comes most to mind right now. You know, on the other hand, you have the Pacific Islanders who were great masters of the seas uh, with perhaps, you know, technology that was more distant to the Japanese. And one thing that I was trying to figure out, but I could never get um, a definite answer is whether there are any reasons for why some island nations are quite bad at navigating and don't have that immediate need to go out into the sea whilst others just take to it. Yeah, and the extreme case is something I've just mentioned, which is the Canary Islands, where right. uh, by the late Middle Ages, there's no evidence that the inhabitants ever sailed anywhere. I, I mean, maybe they paddled around the, the shores, you know, fishing, something like that, but not even from island to island, as far as we know. Uh, maybe by swimming occasionally. Um, so uh, yet they must have arrived there, you know, by sea. And, and there are all sorts of stories about how maybe they were transported there by Roman emperors or Mauritanian kings or something after a rebellion. But you know, you don't have to believe those. Um, no, it's a very interesting feature of uh, the history of navigation and the Japanese. I mean, partly it was a question, I think, of reliance on skilled neighbors. The Koreans seem to have the maritime technology. And I think that sometimes happens. You could say up to a point, you could say the same about the medieval Mediterranean, where the um, where Muslim navies tended to be less efficient, less competent in the long term. I mean, in the early Middle Ages, actually, they were quite effective. Uh, and, you know, it was the Genoese and the Venetians and the Catalans and so on, who really took over uh, and provided, for instance, services for pilgrims going from Muslim Spain to Mecca, you know, by sea. Um, so, um, so that sort of, or the Byzantine Empire, actually, another example where navigational skills were sort of abandoned almost as a matter of public policy at various points in the Middle Ages. So um, it does happen, but you're right, the Polynesian example, of course, that is the other extreme mm -hmm. where we even now have evidence from DNA, which I managed to get into the paperback edition of this book, but not uh, it came out too late for the hardback, uh, that they were able to reach, they did reach South America, uh, and they brought back South American DNA to the Marquesas Islands. Um, 
somewhere in what we would call the Middle Ages. It was extraordinary. So probably not very regular contact, uh, but to have leapt not just across that island space, which, I mean, the colonization of Polynesia took took millennia, but the gap between Polynesia and 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 South America is absolutely enormous. I mean, there's Easter Island out there in the middle of nowhere, but uh, but they managed to do that as well. So we have the great mystery of why were they actually making these voyages? Yeah, and I was particularly intrigued with respect to Easter Island and Hawaii. These very long voyages, and from from what I gather, they almost stopped. Uh, I mean, with Hawaii, there was a bit of trade with the Polynesian islands, but eventually that that, that trade just sort of stopped. Is there any idea why these people who were, you know, so close to the sea, so close to navigating, would have stopped navigating? No, those are very interesting examples. I mean, in the case of Hawaii, we have um, the first mystery, which is why are they going so far north? Uh, Because it actually involved crossing uh, into a different wind system, different currents and so on, which into areas they would normally have avoided. So that partly, I think, explains the the fact that after the colonization of Hawaii in what we would call the early Middle Ages, there was uh, very limited contact, as far as we can see, as far as the archaeological evidence goes, for contact with Polynesia, even though they remembered that their ancestry went back to somewhere usually called Tahiti or Kahiki, it's the same word, which just means some sort of ancestral Island, and the same is true of another case, uh, which is New Zealand, which it's now thought might have been settled as late as the 14th century A.D. So really, very, very late. Um, but although they retained all these extraordinary stories about how they had arrived in New Zealand, and they could even tell you exactly where a particular ancestor sat in a particular boat on the way to the settlement of New Zealand, um, they they really didn't maintain, I mean, they, they, they lost any interest in long distance voyages. They still used boats a lot. I mean, we know that from, for instance, the arrival of Tasman and Cook in New Zealand and the threat that they faced from Maoris in, in boats paddling around their ships. Um, but they turned away from the sea. And I think in both those cases, Hawaii and New Zealand, part of the answer lies in the fact that there were uh, very useful agricultural resources where they'd settled. Uh, the Hawaiian islands, I suppose, you know, you're dealing with rather larger islands than many of these Polynesian islands from which they had come. I mean, that's a generalization. Obviously, there are some reasonably large ones like Fiji. Uh, New Zealand is, of course, two uh, very large islands by Polynesian standards. So so I think that just led to a redirection of energies. Uh, Easter Island is, of course, a great mystery, and there's in, an enormous amount of discussion about, well, particularly the end of the Easter Island civilization, if we can call it that, um, and the building of those extraordinary statues and so on, and the usual assumption that it's somehow bound up with environmental decline generated possibly by human beings, issues to do with the size of population. I mean, every year there's a different explanation. Mm. It seems like the primary motivation for a lot of the cultures that you describe for crossing the oceans or the seas was trade. To what extent do you think the, the human history of the oceans could be described as the history of human trade? Well, I think it's a very important dimension. I think it has acted very much as a spur to moving across. I'm trying to avoid using the word exploring, uh, moving across these big oceanic spaces. The knowledge that, I mean, for instance, uh, that there were these spices out there in the east and the question about how to reach them without trying to cross the great landmass of Asia, which was dominated you know, from a Western European perspective, dominated by hostile powers, uh, by the Ottomans, the uh, the Shahs of Persia, and so on. 
Um, so um, that sort of incentive, but then it's also very much bound up sometimes with religious dimensions. We find that very much with Columbus and his assumption that um, if he can actually find all the gold that he promises is there, all the silk and so on, this can be used to pay for a holy war for the recovery of Jerusalem. And he wasn't the only one thinking in those terms. I mean, that was also a very important element in Portuguese thinking, the, the rivals. So um, trade in, or, or perhaps perhaps trade in itself is, is, is only part of, of the story of the way in which these economic links were, were built up. But it tended to develop into a commercial relationship, as we know, for instance, the Portuguese, if they couldn't get the gold that they wanted from West Africa, then they began to diversify into slaves because slaves were very unfortunately a commodity out of which they could make money or which they could use on their sugar plantations and so on. Now, alongside trade, of course, there's also the cultural dimension, which is very important. And so one of the themes which I'm trying to bring out when I can is the way in which these commercial links acted as vectors for the movement of ideas, um, um, objects which had an enormous influence on on artistic taste in, in, in other places. I mean, we've already talked a little bit about Japan, and that is perhaps the most obvious case of this, the this constant flow of cultural influences from China and Korea. And you know, measuring that against the insistence in Japan that they have to do things their own way as well, as a sort of Japanese way, mm. which is slightly different. And um, associated with that as well, uh, very importantly, the movement of religious texts. So the history of the oceans, if you think of the Indian Ocean in particular, and you can look at these waves of uh, religious ideas, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, moving, and then actually with the Portuguese, etc., Christianity, moving from west to east uh, and, and affecting these sort of great conquests, if you like, in areas like Indonesia, Malaysia and, and China and so on. So uh, that's a very important theme as well. Uh, and sometimes we can even trace the movement of these pilgrims. There's this Japanese pilgrim, Enin, for instance. We have the diary of his visit in the ninth century to China and his special relationship with a, a Korean bandit, uh, uh, Chang Pogo, which is absolutely fascinating. Yes, um, yes. Yes, and that's a wonderful story. I have to say, it was uh, one thing that I particularly enjoyed from your book was the individual accounts that you managed to tease out. There was also a, a Jewish merchant, I think. I can't remember from where exactly. But what I got from all of these accounts was how similar human motivations are now, even now, to back then. And even this sense of a, of a nostalgia for a homeland, the desire to go out, make your fortune, but then eventually come back home. Back, yeah. And, um, but of course, I mean, an, another, we often think that another motivation for this, this quest outwards into the sea is to discover a new land or maybe just to discover a new place. Do you think that there are people who went out for the sake of discovery, for the sake of the adventure? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, Barry Cunliffe, the uh, Oxford archaeologist, he's written about this in the context particularly of the prehistoric Atlantic and argues that there is a sort of um, adventurism gene which is implanted in some but not all of us. And we'll leave it to the DNA experts to identify it. But, and, and I suppose, I mean, there is an element of that. If you take, for instance, the extraordinary voyages, and this actually takes one back to what Cunliffe has written about, the Greek Pythias, who, I mean, there's a great deal of debate. There was a great deal of debate, even in antiquity, whether he really visited all these lands, which would include Britain, and according to some people, even Iceland, which I think is a bit far-fetched. But there's certainly curiosity there. There are a number of cases where people are clearly, clearly traveling out of curiosity, 
about um, it may be the natural history of the world beyond the areas where they're familiar, or the human history of the world uh, beyond w uh, the areas with which they're familiar. So that is certainly an issue um, and a sort of early tourism. Um, <laughs> I mean, I dealt with, actually, this was in my Mediterranean book, but I had one or two people, a man called Syriac of Ancona, who traveled around the Greek world, the, the late Byzantine world, and he went to Delphi, for instance, and he thought that he'd found various sort of his, he got everything wrong. I mean, temples confused with theaters and vice versa. But nonetheless, a sort of antiquarianism there. And uh, that's not unusual. I mean, the same with a 12th century Jewish traveler, Benjamin of Tudela, who describes even China, though he got nowhere near there. But uh, he was absolutely fascinated by classical antiquity, um, which is interesting because it wasn't presumably part of his education back in Spain. Well, it may have been, who knows. So we do get that sort of those people who are traveling out of curiosity and in the early phases of the exploration of the Americas, that uh, might indeed be an issue. But there I do see again and again the search for material advantage, the search for gold, uh, the search for land. In the Polynesian world, who knows You know what the motives are? It, it, it's quite possible that sheer curiosity set off a lot of these journeys. In the 18th century, certainly scientific uh, dimensions to mm. the journeys. So we've got this whole question of mapping the transit of Venus, which took British ships into the Pacific. And yet I do um, drop more than a hint that the science, although people tend, historians of science tend to talk up the scientific motives. I think that um, you know, imperial concerns, if you like, were more important in, in that sort of expedition. Right. Yeah. Uh, on this topic of discovery and discoverers, in sort of everyday discourse, we tend to put a lot of importance on the discoverer of X, uh, sort of a kind of a, a great man, uh, sort of uh, view of history. Uh, do you think that discovery is, or can you put a lot of the success of a discovery into one individual, or is it really more of a cumulative process of many individuals coming together? Yeah, no, I think that's a very important question. I think there's been a lot of sort of misunderstanding as a result, as you say, of this sort of great man, who's always a man, uh, approach to history. Uh, and there are cases where, yeah, there is an individual. I mean, Columbus is the great example of that, who has this bee in his bonnet. He's absolutely convinced that he can find a short route to China and Japan. And everybody in Spain to start off with, and Portugal and so on, they, they all think he, it's uh, far-fetched. But, um, but he gets his way and he achieves... Um, not quite what he set out to do, <laughs> achieves this great discovery, which he, throughout his life, still thinks is part of Asia uh, for voyages. And so he keeps going back, looking for more. Um, and that does add up to, and then his, you know, his friend Amerigo Vespucci, after whom America is named, um, he also, there's a sort of element there of setting out to, you know, to map new lands and so on. So I think there are these cases, particularly in that period, the end of the 15th, 16th century. But if you actually look at what discovery really means, you know, sometimes we're talking about places which were known about, which had to be rediscovered. So there's the question of Greenland, for instance, or indeed you could even say Labrador because the Vikings had been there. Um, and information about that part of the world had actually been retained in Scandinavia. It's possible that Columbus picked up some of that information if, as some people argue, he visited Iceland. Hmm. So in that sense, the idea that discovery very often involves rediscovery, I mean, that's one side of it, but there's another side of it which is another side of this this concept of of knowing about a place but not having quite registered what you know and that this example of australia here which is very interesting because it's quite clear that portuguese and dutch ships 
were coming up to the shores of Australia, I'll put it that way, sometimes being wrecked off the shores of Australia uh, long before, I mean, you know, as I say, the idea that Captain Cook discovered Australia is, of course, nonsensical. Um, there were Dutch navigators, I've mentioned Tasman already, but even before that, you know, possibly in the late 16th century, uh, ships, as, as occasional archaeological discoveries seem to show, you know, Portuguese cannon found in in, in uh, underwater archaeological sites, that sort of thing. So the problem was that they didn't really have a way of fitting it into their conception of the world. They weren't particularly interested in what they found, which was Western Australia, pretty desolate areas. Uh, the inhabitants were not of interest to them, I'll put it that way. I mean, they obviously regarded the indigenous inhabitants as, I suppose, primitive would be the word to use in this context. Um, and possibly, uh, although Captain Cook tried to avoid this, but uh, possibly some of their encounters with them were quite sort of bloody ones. So Australia was sort of left off the mental map and people were much more interested in finding a temperate southern continent, uh, which somehow they managed to detach from, from what information they had about this big land to the south of uh, New Guinea. Yeah, so it's a gradual process of absorption of information. And one thing I therefore try to do is to shift the attention when possible away from some of these famous discoveries and think about the ways in which contact was built up and maintained. So if we're looking at the Caribbean, for instance, the fact that within 20 years of Columbus's first arrival in the Caribbean, you've got ships going back, back and forth, back and forth. I mean, the numbers are really very impressive. And all right, some of them are bringing Spanish troops across and settlers and cattle and things like that. But but there really was an endless toing and froing, uh, and it's really at that point that one can really think of these lands like Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, as becoming really part of the sort of wider consciousness of Europeans. Yes, one thing that I was I found very funny was the uh, continuous activity of what I've called armchair geography of people uh, postulating in their offices about how the world ought to be or must be. And how it, it never was how they expected it to be. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the the Northwest Passage, the Northeast Passage, yeah. the uh, the assumption that it should be possible to sail. And I mean, we even have one writer saying it would be much easier to sail around the top of Russia because <laughs> the temperatures will be much more amenable. You know, it's so hot going around the Cape of Good Hope and through the Indian Ocean. But you know. Um, when they did get up to the Barents Sea, they discovered how how <laughs> extremely hostile an environment it was and froze to death in some cases, of course. Yes. Um, do you think that when, when we're thinking about discovery, you've, you've mentioned the, the, the Dutch navigators that must have seen Australia and then Thomas Cook, who sort of is, who went sort of further in. Do you think that there is a difference between a notion of discovery as like the immediate perception of the landmass of knowing that something is there and the idea of sort of going about and really understanding what it is you're looking at. You know, Columbus thought that he was looking at India or Asia and we can say that he discovered that area of the world. But could we not also say that the people after him who, re who then discovered what was really there are also in a sense discovering what it is that is actually the case? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And I think for that reason, it isn't totally nonsensical that Amerigo Vespucci uh, gives his name to the Americas because he's the one who, not initially actually, but gradually he begins to argue that this is a new world. Uh, but even then, he's not entirely sure. You know, there, there's still the assumption really, I mean, it lingers right up to the 18th century that the Americas may at the very top be linked to Asia, that this might be an, an absolutely enormous sort of peninsula, North America, South America, sticking out of Asia. Um, because it was much neater to think of all the continents being connected to one another as Africa is to Asia and obviously Europe, well, not really a continent at all, but anyway. Um, 
so uh, and why would that be well that actually comes back to some of these arguments about the origins of humanity so if as some of the map makers were already beginning to suggest in the early 16th century the americas are uh, are physically separate from asia then how did all these people these millions of people come into existence uh, which had enormous implications for recognition of their human status so were they part of the same divine creation were they equally human even if they were a separate creation and if they weren't equally human did that mean one could subject them uh, how did that relate to missionizing you know, attempts to christianize uh, the population of peru mexico etc so it had enormous repercussions mm. uh, you've briefly touched on this already but how seriously should we take the the desire to christianize a people with the hope of civilizing them with the hope of making them sort of a quote unquote uh, humans civilized humans yeah, in, I, I mean, certainly that uh, was uh, a, a pretty basic assumption that it would be good for these people to be converted. Let me, uh, we'll stay perhaps for a moment then in the Americas, because one figure whom I mentioned, uh, Bartolome de las Casas, this uh, early 16th century, if you like, propagandist, I'm not using that in a, in a ne term in a negative way, for the rights of the native population of the Americas. And particularly in his short history of the destruction of the Indies, he described, for instance, in the uh, conquest of Cuba, the most extraordinary violence. And even though you can argue that sometimes he was being a bit of a propagandist, there's no doubt that violence on that scale did exist in, in, in large part. Um, so, um, so his answer to this was still that the Indians, we'll call them that because that was how they were seen in this particular worldview, that they did need to be Christianized, but it should be a gradual process. And that was what God wanted. There's a very extraordinary uh, sort of extension of this, which occurs in a late 16th century writer called Alonso de Espinosa, who was a follower of Las Casas. Um, and he is a member of the same religious order. And he was actually interested in the other Atlantic area that had been conquered at the same time, which I mentioned earlier, the Canaries. And he argued again for the conversion, sorry, for the Christianization of the native population. Well, by his time, it had largely disappeared, actually. Mm. Um, the settlers had taken over. But he also argued that God had always had I'll put it this way, a soft spot for the Canary Islanders, even when they were pagan. And that all sorts of miracles, there'd been a miracle when an image of the Virgin Mary had been washed up on the shores of Tenerife. Uh, and they had sort of worshipped this image without actually knowing anything about Christianity. They had this sort of instinct towards it. So that sort of argument that that there was something deeply rooted in these pagan peoples which would instinctively draw them towards Christianity was something which in the sort of school of Las Casas was, was very important. When you look at the Portuguese, it's interesting to see a rather different approach in Japan, trying to make headway. Is it a political program trying to bring Japan into not necessarily into the Portuguese empire, which at that stage was not a landed empire anyway, but trying to build close ties with Japan and encouraging Christianization, particularly of southern Japan. And then there's, first of all, the shoguns are quite sort of receptive to this, um, see the Portuguese as useful trading partners, um, and then increasingly they turn against them. And we have these um, sort of, if you like, pogroms against the Christian population in southern Japan around Nagasaki. So, I, I mean, salvation of souls was always, of course, very high on the agenda of, of these people.
Yeah, and it must have come into tension with people who wanted to profit from the selling of slaves as well, because once once they're Christians, you can't really enslave them anymore, can you? But that is true. Yes, I mean, uh, though there were ways around this, of course, sure. inevitably. But um, but um, it it yeah, I mean, they they were dealing uh, very consciously with rulers who were. Uh, who were animists or whatever, some some of them Muslim. Uh, when they got down to Angola, actually, it's an interesting question, which is a little bit to the north of what we would call Angola, uh, but these kingdoms which uh, adopted, the, the rulers adopted Christianity from the Portuguese, took names like Afonso, uh, and they did get drawn into the slave trade eventually. But the general strategy of the rulers, the African rulers, was to encourage the export of slaves not from their own people. I mean, we have to remember what enormous ethnic variety mm -hmm. there was, uh, conflicts between different African peoples leading to the capture of slaves and uh, a willingness to, um, yeah, to, to sell, to export slave population. Um, Without necessarily, I mean, th there's a difference clearly between the way slavery was understood within these African kingdoms, where we could probably describe it more as a form of serfdom, very much tied to exploitation of the land and and, and what these people were going to face when they were taken to a Portuguese feitoria factory and then loaded on ships and taken to the Americas, which of course was horrific. Right, yes. You conclude your book with the, the following remark, and I quote, by the beginning of the 21st century, the ocean world of the last four millennia had ceased to exist. Um, a very powerful statement after 900 pages of history. <laughs> in your opinion, are there any observable differences, and I invite you to speculate, in how human relations have altered because of this change in the significance of the ocean world and how we treat it? Well, uh, what, yes. I mean, let me explain what I'm uh, talking about there, because I, I think this will lead to an answer to your question. What I was observing was a very significant change in two ways in which we relate to use, if you like, the oceans. Um, the first of them concerned uh, the way passengers move across the oceans, because, of course, since the 1950s, we've become much, much less reliant on moving by sea, particularly across large ocean spaces. Uh, and, you know, we fly, well, <laughs> up to the pandemic, we were all flying everywhere. And that's a different type of movement, not just because it's a different type of vehicle, much faster and so on, but also because it takes you, it can take you from the middle of a continent to the middle of another continent, going over an ocean without actually experiencing uh, the sea, if you like. I mean, you might, if you're lucky, see it out of the window of your aeroplane um, when the clouds break, but that's about it. So there's that transformation, which means that nowadays the way in which sort of reasonably well-off people in Europe and the Americas and, and Australia and so on uh, relate to uh, ocean voyages is through the cruise industry, really. So one of the things I describe is the peculiar origins of the cruise industry in the 50s and 60s, in mainly in Miami, actually. And, you know, you open the Sunday newspapers nowadays and they're full of all these cruising supplements and so on. And, you know, book now, thousand pound discount on room with balcony, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you're basically going round in a circle. You're, 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 you may come back from a different uh, airport to your home, but, you know, basically when you're at sea, you're, you're, the intention of the journey is, is just to go round come back to where you started from. The other great transformation is the the nature of ports, which is related to containerization and the way in which we move goods across the sea. And this is actually much more important, I think, that you know, if you went back to the 1950s and you thought of New York or Boston and you'd have all these longshoremen and stevedores and all these rather specialized people who were concerned with the loading and unloading of goods 
into ships, um, unpacking, uh, heavily unionized usually, which gave them quite a lot of leverage uh, in, you know, sort of um, negotiating um, their, their wages, all that sort of thing. And port cities were still places which contained usually a very mixed population, actually, of people. They would obviously tend to act as magnets for people from uh, across the oceans, um, not just merchants, but artisans, everything like that. So, again, thinking of New York, you know, Little Italy, Little Poland, little Ch uh, Chinatown, etc., etc. So you, you have that phenomenon of the port city looking outwards, very interesting cultural phenomenon. You have interesting questions about the relationship between the different peoples in these cities and the cultural influences, which, you know, may consist of, you know, people eating pizza, but, but that's actually part of the story as well. But when you actually look at the way cargoes move nowadays, let's say you want to send uh, containers from St. Louis, Missouri to Warsaw. All right, so, all right, they will, as they move by rail, probably down to, uh, to a port, papers will be checked and so on. But most of the containers will be sealed up. You know, we're talking about container ships nowadays that, like the one in, that, that got stuck in the Suez Canal, 18,000 containers. That's phenomenal. So you can't check everything. They are heavily automated. You think of ports like Rotterdam, Felixstowe in England. The goods simply being sort of lifted up by this crane, put in the hold in a secure location, and so on, so they don't fall off, which is very important. Um, particularly, have these great towers of uh, of containers, and it's a totally different sort of relationship. Uh, therefore, the ports have become machines, and obviously there are people, you know, helping to operate the machines. There will be people who operate the cranes and so on, but with um, technology moving as fast as it is, you know, before long, perhaps they will be pretty well invisible. We've been, I remember just after the book came out, there was talk of ships navigating the seas, I mean, cargo ships navigating the seas without a crew. Uh, so there would be somebody sitting in uh, a sort of command centre in, goodness says where, perhaps nowhere near the sea, you know, maybe in Moscow or or, or whatever, um, and just sort of, you know, telling, you know, Russian cargo ships to change direction, you know, you, um, go to Brazil, <laughs> you go to go whatever, go to Uruguay, depending on, on you know, how the markets function. That's a totally different world yes. to, uh, to what, we're, uh, what we've been looking at, even with the great transformations of the 19th century, like the coming of steam. Yeah, and obviously, as your title suggests, your book is a human history of the oceans. You're, you're not particularly concerned with how humans have thought of the sea as a part of the environment that we have to uh, care for. But it is something that we have started thinking about in the last 80 years, more or less. Even though in the past, there are these figures. I mean, it's a very common trope of people fearing and respecting the ocean, you know, the great, the great mother ocean. Do you think that the way that we relate to the ocean as an entity is part of this transformation of how we view it as something that we have to look after? No, I think that's a very good point. I think that because the ocean is something which, in a certain sense, we have less uh, familiar contact with, we've become interested in different aspects of the ocean. We've become interested in the ocean from perspectives that uh, perhaps wouldn't have been regarded as high priorities, wrongly perhaps, by, you know, the, I mean, think of the whaling industry, for instance, mm. uh, that was accepted as normal in the 19th century, it was a massive American whaling industry, and it's still in Norway and Japan. I remember being surprised a few years ago in Oslo, walking past a restaurant where I saw they were offering whale steaks. So, uh, but we're now much more conscious of these environmental issues. And it's also because our impact on the sea has, has you know, increased incrementally in the last uh, few decades. Dumping of plastics, all that sort of thing. 
So, yes, I mean, that's not the sort of story I'm trying to tell, but I think you're absolutely right that the way in which we view the oceans now is is very different. A sort of prioritization of the oceans, this emphasis on the idea of the blue planet, so putting the blueness at the front, which is a, a sort of welcome change from the idea of planet Earth. Um, somebody suggested, I think it was in a review of my book, that rather than calling the Earth planet Earth, we should call it planet ocean, because <laughs> from space, of course, that's what you see by and large. It's that blueness yeah. which, which is most striking. Uh, at the moment, you know, I don't say that much about the fishing industry in my book, because fishermen, they many of them are tending to sort of go out and come back home, as it were. I mean, you think of people fishing in British home waters. But the impact of very long distance uh, fishing fleets on you know, the, the use of trawlers, some of which are outlawed in, in, uh, in European waters, uh, all of this is having, uh, having a massive effect. So we, that's something certainly that you know, I'd leave to the environmental historians. The history of what's going on under the surface of the sea. I'm very much concerned with the surface of the sea <clears throat> is an important question. Uh, so finally, I wonder whether you could say a bit about uh, your future projects. Uh, you haven't left many bodies of water to write about. Well, yeah, I mean, there are some quite, there's some smaller ones which are worth comparing. There are bodies of water which I've looked at, but might be worth looking at from a different perspective. To give you an example, the Adriatic is, if you like, a sort of Mediterranean within the Mediterranean. And that is certainly a very interesting case. That it's a sea that, you know, I often find myself going back to when it's possible to travel. I, I go there fairly often. Uh, and uh, the Baltic, the Baltic features in this book, but very much for its wider connections. So looking at what's happening within the Baltic would be extremely interesting. The Black Sea is a sea I've written very, very little about. And so I think there's still quite a lot of watery spaces <laughs> I, can, I can deal with. Wonderful. Well, David, I will love you. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with David Abalafia. As I mentioned in the introduction to the episode, this is the post-interview reflection segment of the podcast. The aim of this part is to spend a little more time to reflect on some of the ideas that were explored in the interview, but that we didn't have time to discuss. We spoke a lot about discovery in the episode, and I know it's not a central theme of David Abalafia's book, but it is a concept that I'm greatly interested in, and I wanted to explore it a bit further in the segment. I get the feeling that when we talk about discovery, that there are a lot of different notions of discovery that are intersecting and sometimes in conflict. There seem to be a few different ways that we can talk about discovery. First, we talk about discovery as this brute sensory perception. We say that Columbus, or rather nowadays we say the Vikings, discovered the American continent because they were the first Europeans to see it. But it is often retorted that neither of them had any idea what they were looking at. Which brings us to another way that people talk about discovery. We say that something has been discovered when it has been understood. In this sense, discovery is based on understanding rather than just seeing. An underlying aspect of discovery that I think is common to both of these is the idea that someone is the first person to see or understand something. So, in this little segment, what I'd like to discuss is really just the merits and limitations of these two notions of discovery and a suggestion for how we might think about discovery in a more fruitful way. So let's begin with discovery as brute perception. Columbus is the classic case here, though we could also use the Viking discovery of northeastern America as an example, as I mentioned. In both cases, the explorers had chanced on a landmass that they had never seen before. Neither of them had understood what they saw. In fact, they both thought, funnily enough, that they had stumbled onto Asia. If brew perception is the criterion, then the Vikings are credited with being the first Europeans to discover America. But what about who the first people were to discover America? 
surely the first people that crossed the Bering Strait, that thin piece of ice that must have appeared 20,000 years ago, connecting the top right-hand side of Russia and the top left-hand side of America, of the North American continent. Surely they were the first people to have seen America. Surely whoever was at the very front of that group that was crossing saw America and was the true discoverer of America, whoever they may have been. So this is undoubtedly one way that we typically talk about discovery. You know, when you've found a new coffee shop, right? You say to your friends, ah, oh, I've discovered this place. You saw it at that corner, I've discovered it. But there is, I think, one thing about this notion of discovery that I'm, I don't think is very compelling. And it's that it doesn't understand discovery as this peculiar social activity, but rather as something that is just like having a new sensory perception. So, in this sense, the experience of the first human looking at America is no different to the first time I found that new coffee shop on the corner, assuming I was the first person to see it. And this seems to be at odds with the importance with which we assign discovery, at least in our society. Discoveries are supposed to radically change how we think. But did the discovery of America 20,000 years ago radically change how the first humans thought? That's impossible to know. But we do know that it had no effect on how the Vikings thought, as David Abelafia details in his really good chapter on the Viking colonization of Greenland and Northeastern America. The discovery of America by the Vikings in the 10th century had absolutely no effect on the rest of Europe. Much like my discovery of the coffee shop at that corner has no effect on the rest of society. But the discovery of America by Columbus in 1492 is clearly a moment in history that had a sizable effect on the rest of the world. And his discovery sounds much more like a discovery than the Viking discovery of America. Okay, so that's one way that we might think about discovery by perception and one way that we might prioritize one discovery by perception over another discovery by perception. It's not just about who sees it first, but it's also about which discovery is met with a proper social uh, reaction. Okay, so I've said enough about this. Let's go on to the second way that we might understand discovery. Something is discovered when it is understood. So what is meant by understood can be varied. You know, for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that we're talking about the discovery of new lands, since we're talking about geography. And what we mean is that someone has understood generally the geographical presentation and the position of the landmass in relation to the rest of the world. So in this respect, Amerigo Vespucci might be a good candidate for having discovered America, since, as David Abelafia also remarks on the episode, he was the first person to have properly grasped that this was an entirely new continent, that he had grasped that he was looking at something new. And not just that he was looking at something new, but that he had understood that it was new. Whereas the Vikings and Columbus, they, they realized that they were looking at something new, but they didn't understand it as something new. For them, it was something old. It was Asia. They already knew about Asia. Asia was not a new concept. So admittedly, I like this notion of discovery a bit more since it's, it's meteor. It involves a discoverer actually knowing what it is that they're looking at. And that seems more significant than knowing that you've seen something new without understanding what it is that you're looking at. And I think this is something that chimes with our modern day conception or at least common sense conception of discovery. So in this sense, the Spooch discovered America because he was the first person to understand that it's a distinct landmass. But even this notion of discovery needs to be supplemented with the right social conditions, i.e. that the discovery of a distinct landmass is significant, or at least more significant, than, than the discovery of other things. So just to go back to the silly coffee shop example, even if I understand why there is a new coffee shop. I understand that, I don't know, there, there used to be an old shop, but that old shop wasn't good at business. <laughs> and it went out of business, and now there's a new coffee shop, and the new coffee shop is there because it's a better idea, and it's gonna work out for that area of the street. In, this, in both cases, I've understood what it is that I'm looking at. I've understood sort of the story behind it. But 
I mean, I think we would all agree, but they're substantially different. And I think the difference lies in the fact that people see new coffee shops all the time. But I presume only six humans have seen a new landmass all the time. Or at least that they were the first people to see a new landmass and to understand that they were looking at a new landmass. And this only makes sense within a society that already takes for granted the idea that there are significant discoveries and less significant discoveries. I think what we have to remember is that discoveries are not natural events, but human specific events that can only occur within very particular social conditions. So this brings me to a little interlude into science that I think is quite pertinent here. I first came across a discussion of the concept of discovery in Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. That's a wonderful book, also recommend it. Kuhn, in one of the chapters, I can't remember which one, is discussing the concept of discovery in science. And he takes as a case study the discovery of oxygen. So he takes three possible candidates for the discovery of oxygen. The first is the Swedish guy, C.W. Scheler, who was probably the first person to isolate pure oxygen. But he never published his results. He never told the rest of the scientific community that he had isolated this new gas. Okay, so second, there's the British scientist, Joseph Priestley, who came pretty close. He isolated an impure sample of oxygen. It, it probably wasn't pure ox oxygen. It probably was made up of other gases as well. And third, there's the French chemist Lavoisier, to whom we traditionally attribute the discovery of oxygen because he was the first to isolate a pure sample of oxygen and to understand what it was. What's interesting about Kuhn's discussion is that he immediately discards Sheila as a realistic candidate, despite the fact that he was the first person to see pure oxygen. For Kuhn, what is essential to discovery is that it is shared with your community. If you discover oxygen and don't tell anyone about it, then you haven't discovered oxygen. So there isn't like this, this um, objective checklist above humanity that ticks the box oxygen when the first human has seen oxygen. Discovery is this thing that takes place within a community, within a group of people who understand what it is to discover something and who have agreed on the kinds of things that are discoverable. So it seems to me that Kuhn is quite close to the understanding notion of discovery but only if it's supplemented with the idea of a community now for those of you who know this concept this idea is obviously inspired by david Watson in his great book the invention of science and he runs with this idea the furthest and he provides a robust argument for why we should think that the concept of discovery was only discovered in 1492 with columbus's discovery of america and, you know, he really pushes this idea that it only really makes sense within a community that understands discovery. I'm not going to go into any more detail because we're going to talk about this in, my, in our interview. And this isn't, this isn't about Wotton, this is about David Abalakia's book, it's about discovery, about geographical discovery. But I just thought that this little the comparison with science and the concept of scientific discovery might help to elucidate the way that we might think about geographical discovery because with geography especially we do put a lot of emphasis on seeing on perceiving on just seeing and that's because you might think that there isn't much conceptual content behind a landmass that it's just land it's just earth seeing it is you know you're the first person to see it that's it there isn't anything more to it i think there is something more to it i think there is an understanding that needs to be had of what you are looking at i think that's all i'm going to say about discovery I would just like to conclude by saying how much I enjoyed The Boundless Sea. It's a great book. I recommend it to everyone. He touches on so many topics, starting with the Polynesian Islanders, the Great Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, moving through the Indian Ocean, touching on the trade route from the Spice Islands to the Red Sea, the Gulf of Persia, China, Japan, moving on to the European contact with the Americas, and then looking at the whole world as this chain of connection across the oceans. Thank you for listening to my episode today. Make sure to tune in to my next episode with Seb Falk, author of The Light Ages, where we'll be discussing Seb's thesis that the Middle Ages were not all that bad. Please share this episode with family and friends. Find me on social media on Twitter, at Please Expand, with just one E between the words, and visit my website, 
www.pleaseexpand.com. And there's a forum there where I've posted a reflection and a further reflection on the book. Please feel free to engage with that, share your own ideas. I'm eager to engage, I'm eager to discuss. Thank you very much once again. I'm Helios Rockney. Bye bye.